Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. Hi, my name's Melvin, and it's finally Gene weather. Welcome to Cinematic Doctrine, a Christian podcast service that encourages and equips Christians to engage and reform the culture of cinema. In this episode, Daniel and I will be discussing David Lowry's A Ghost Story. We've been covering an obscene amount of Disney productions lately, what with the Marvel films and two Disney Plus exclusives, we covered Hamilton, we covered Stargirl. So I think it's safe to say we're ready to move away from Disney for a while, or as long as we can, because Disney very clearly has a hold on the film market. We'll inevitably get back to them, but we want to head into a more independent and creative atmosphere. And that's where a ghost story comes in. After the break, you'll get a chance to hear how Daniel and I initially reacted to the trailer for A Ghost Story back in 2017. You know, seeing an atmospheric, visually stunning film with a man wearing a sheet ghost costume. After that, you'll hear about Daniel's excellent theater experience with a random stranger. Then I dig into how a scene emotionally destroyed me and how A Ghost Story uses simple yet prolonged sequences to produce strong emotions. Among those emotions, we discuss how, for a lot of people, Laughter seemed to be a predominant reaction to a lot of scenes that take place in a ghost story. And finally, Daniel and I dig into the concept of interpretation, and how certain art pieces are created to provoke emotions or feelings, and less concerned with giving definitive answers. As stated in the Stargirl episode of the podcast, we're changing up how the introduction functions, the film synopsis, content rating, and call to action will now be part of the discussion. That said, we forgot to record a call to action, so here's that real quick. If you like Cinematic Doctrine, keep up with us and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, have a popular Facebook group that's very active and very fun, a Twitter and an Instagram. You can also leave a review for us on iTunes or Podchaser or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps us out. You can also check out our other offerings, such as monthly movie news and trailer talk. In the latest monthly movie news, I interviewed a local independent theater. You can hear how they're weathering the coronavirus pandemic and hear some ways you can support local theaters, as well as learn how you can pray for your local theaters. And since some theaters are opening back up, you can check out our trailer talk to hear about what's likely to land in a theater near you. And lastly, if you really love us, you can support us monthly on Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you also land some sick perks, like exclusive voting privileges and choosing a movie we discuss in the podcast each month, as well as exclusive access to The Pre-Show, a special podcast series on the Patreon where Daniel and I talk movies, Christianity, or life itself in a casual and open format. Anyways, next time, we'll remember to toss that into the main episode. These intros are too long. Without further ado, here's our discussion on a ghost story. So welcome back to the Cinematic Doctrine podcast. I'm here with Daniel. He is a new guest. We haven't uh, had him on before. Uh, how's it going, Dan? Why don't you uh, tell everybody about yourself? Well, I'm Dan. Uh, geez, uh, I like movies. I've never listened to a podcast before or been on a podcast before. And I'm not even sure how I ended up in front of this microphone um could you please tell me where i've been the past couple of weeks i'm so alone and so scared um this actually segues in the movie pretty well <laughs> you could go into to that i didn't know we were doing a bit to start the podcast that really caught me off guard i was we had a previous conversation we wanted like dan i want you to always open the podcast up because i do the intro and i like the new intro, intro by the way melvin <laughs> you're like i do the intro so it makes more sense if you start out so i was literally gearing up to say something <laughs> and you're like hi dad welcome to the show 
Well, it's been so long. <laughs> and so I just wanted to reintroduce the world to you and say he is not stuck at a hospital anymore. That that life is long. Oh, gone. yeah. A lot has changed. And uh, it's a whole new world. Yeah. When are we going to cover Aladdin? Which one? The bad one. I mean, I guess we could... <laughs> let's put up on Patreon like a poll. We could have Aladdin animated Aladdin live action. One of the many, many other Aladdin like adaptations. List them both as just Aladdin and don't even give the yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we finally got around to watching A Ghost Story, which is a movie that, although you probably didn't know that we wanted to talk about, was a movie that the two of us wanted to talk about. But before we can start talking about it, we figure we should fill you guys in uh, as this is sort of we're trying to do a new introduction where we don't take five minutes to catch you guys up. Or at the very least, introduce you to some wonderful people like Daniel, which is somebody you guys have never met before. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, Dan, why don't you uh, fill us in on what a ghost story is about before we head into things? So, yeah, Ghost Story is a movie from 2017, uh, written and directed by David Lowry. Um, the IMDb description is in this singular, singular exploration of legacy, love, lost in the enormity of existence, a recently deceased white sheeted ghost returns to a suburban home to try to reconnect with his bereft wife. And I don't, do you, Melvin, do you remember when trailers this movie started dropping at all? I vaguely remember seeing some trailers for this. So I started watching a lot of movies around 2016. So I guess that was, yeah, that would be around the time that I probably went to the theaters, saw like something that was a bit more artistic and had this trailer run in the beginning of it. And I feel like I remember thinking it would be dumb. And I feel like that was something <laughs> consistent with most people. But I thought, really? yeah, it looks visually striking. Now, I was still a Babber cinephile. So I've grown. I've gotten better. Something like this fascinates me now. But yeah. Why do you ask? Oh, I just remember because I'm not sure what I was seeing around the time. But I, I was going to a good number of, I guess, what you would call prestige films at the time. I would I would go to theater and I would see, you know, things and and there'd be like maybe three or other four other people in the entire theater. And I live in a kind of like a metropolitan kind of area. So in theory, you'd have a lot of like college students or artsy artsy people. But even then, like a lot of I was seeing a lot of movies that weren't didn't have a lot of uh audience, so to speak. But this trailer played in front of front of a lot of movies I was seeing at the time. And I was pretty excited for it. I wasn't um I wasn't like super hyped about or anything. I wasn't going online and reading fan theories about the movie. Not that there would be such a thing for this, but I was really, really excited to see it. And then I remember actually having to plan a day around going to see it because it just wasn't playing anywhere. So I had to like find a theater, like block off a whole day to see it, make sure I had the day off from work because I had to drive like two hours from where I live to see it and that kind of thing. So leading up to the movie, I was really excited to see it. Um, but you weren't particularly <laughs> jazzed about watching a guy in a what looked like a bed sheet walk around a house while indie music played or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have I I wasn't nearly as comfortable with creativity at the time or trustworthy in creativity. I think wasn't didn't um, Swiss Army Man come out on the same year. And like, I guess I was interested in that because I thought this is so absurd <laughs> And then for this movie, I just thought this doesn't look like it'll work. But yeah, I I have my thoughts and they're good thoughts. They're actually a lot better than my initial babber 2017 year old Melvin, 2017 year old, 2017 uh, Melvin. <laughs> but uh, we should probably at least touch base on, you know, the, the rating for this movie. It's rated R kind of strangely enough, Is because it? like when you watch it, yeah, it's it's rated R. When you watch it, though, oh. it doesn't feel like an R-rated movie. In fact, if I go to the certificates guide on IMDb, there's a lot of places where it's listed as PG, rated 12-year-old and up, PG-13. And here in the United States, it's rated R. for some, uh, In Australia, it's rated M as well. But for the most part, it's kind of clean. Um, the only content you're running into is people hug and kiss, and it looks really romantic. There's a topless man in a scene. There's a, a woman who's wearing a bed sheet to cover herself in the middle of the night, but it's not provocative. And then there's like death. There's a child involved and there's stuff like that. So I can see that being challenging. In fact, that's, I think, the reason it probably got a rated R here in the States. Yeah. 
And also the MPAA is like really uncomfortable with like tone. So if like something tonally is really, really difficult for the MPAA, they'll give it an R. I think Constantine didn't, wasn't that shared during the um, Comic-Con or Comic-Con online or whatever this year that Constantine got a rated R because the, the MPAA within five minutes was like, this movie feels hopeless. <laughs> and so they, so they gave it a rated R. <laughs> so it's like, oh man. Um, but there is a use of an F, uh, um, there is one use of the F word and there's a couple other language, but it's like, I think two or three. Cause like, I just don't remember because there's no lines in this movie. <laughs> so, uh, and white lines there are, they're used very, very well. So they wouldn't waste their time with, you know, aggressive language, but yeah, that, that's my experience with the, with the right. content. Yeah. And there's a really spooky ghost running around. Oh my goodness. Just, yeah. The sheet, ah, blood, so blood scary. curling. <laughs> kind of like how the conjuring got an art just cause it's too scary. I don't know if you remember when that happened. Is that true? Yes. I thought that was PG 13. It's the first conjuring movies radar just because I think it's called, if you look at the actual rating, it says something like pervasive fear or something, something similar in language to that because it's just too frightening. That's a roller coaster ride movie. That's not frightening. Yeah. And they specifically shot the movie to be PG thirteen. It, it feels like it's shot to be PG thirteen. Yeah. If they were going for R, they would have pushed that. But but it doesn't need to be R. So like, no. why did it? There's no blood. There's no sexual content. There's really no language that I can remember. Well, actually, it's the other spooky. thing with the other thing with the MPAA is uh, demons. If demons are in a movie, they also that was the other Constantine thing. The guy said, if you want to get an R, just put one demon in there for no reason <laughs> and they'll just rate it r and why aren't so. christian films all like <laughs> like nc-17 or i don't know uh anyways but i mean part part of why i'm asking about like what your thoughts were going into the movies i feel like this is definitely a movie that horribly suffered from people's perceptions as well as the expectation right. of the movie absolutely from from both sides because i remember seeing the trailer and thinking this was not the movie i expected and i was excited for the movie i really thought it'd be this like artsy fartsy interstellar or something like that where it'd be like this like grand journey with all these interesting monologues and characters and then obviously be these cool set pieces i did not expect it to be an almost well very purposefully a singular location film with very minimal dialogue and not a lot going on and we're going to get into this in a bit but when I saw this at theaters, there's one other person in the theater and they fell asleep and were loudly snoring for an hour of the film. That's sick. <laughs> <laughs> what a champ. <laughs> yeah. And it, this was a small, <laughs> it was a small indie theater where like all of the people working there um, had goofy colored hair and piercings and all that stuff. But there was also construction outside. So I could also hear construction <laughs> for the entire film as well. <laughs> Because they're remodeling the building that the indie theater was attached to. But despite all of that, I really liked the movie. And the guy who fell asleep liked the movie as well as I asked him, <laughs> hey, what did you think of that? And he went, oh, it's real interesting, real interesting. I'm going to I think I missed some of it. I I'm gonna watch that again. <laughs> I was like, well, it's a good one. So you should definitely check it out again. That's awesome. <laughs> so I um, I ended up sharing when I first watched this. This is the second time I've watched it this year because I think this was a Man, did was this during the quarantine binge? Did I watch this? I think it was a little before, but one of my uh, an older fellow from church saw that I posted about it in Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group, which everybody can go check out and join and talk to like minded Christians and talk about movies. But anyways, I shared in there, and he goes, "Is this movie wholesome?" He just asked me that like on the post. He's kind of a goofy guy, and I go, "Yeah, it's pretty wholesome. It's challenging, but it's there's nothing there's nothing inappropriate or." stereotypical christian view of hollywood there's nothing like that in this movie <laughs> where where they're trying to indoctrinate you you're, you're good yeah. and then i asked him about it and he said my wife loved it and i fell asleep so i was like that seems to be you know <laughs> you either really like it <laughs> or you fall asleep that's the ratio <laughs> for every one person that sees uh, it <laughs> but yeah i really i really liked it i i really enjoyed it a lot and it's hard it's actually kind of hard to talk about why i liked it before getting into the actual meat and bones of a discussion of the movie but yeah to, to really summarize i found it to be a very rewarding experience it's a kind of it is kind of a singular experience and it i don't know how much how little hold up on repeated repeat viewings but still feel those movies that i would really like people to check out at least just to just to just to feel get the vibe one time for it but yeah uh, what do you think nolan yeah, this was so, like I said, this is the second time I watched it. And I think 
you're talking about repeated viewings is if you had a good time the first time for me, I would say you'll have a better time rewatching it to contextualize my first experience. It was, I really enjoyed it. And then there's sort of a shift in the story about one third into it that isn't drastic, but it's enough to really kind of adopt the tone and the message and the experience that you're getting we'll dig into that a bit later because one of the things that Daniel and I talked about prior to this is we don't really want to talk about too much specifics because like Daniel said, it's a journey. And part of what makes the movie fun is going on that journey and going to places you don't know that you're going to, but that's the first time you watch it can be disorienting. And so it kind of lost me after about a third, that first time through, and then like it picked back up, but that, kind of tarnished the on experience now just finishing it probably like 40 minutes ago finishing it again i i mean i loved it way more than the other time it hit very differently the first third is recontextualized by what you watch later on and i gotta tell you man i (laughs) i was just like falling apart there's one scene where rooney mara is listening to a song And like the first time you watch it, it's a bit weird because like nothing happens because this whole movie, you could really say nothing happens. But then you watch it the second time and I'm like, so much is happening right now. (laughs) And the fact that nothing is happening on screen is why it's so emotionally powerful. And I'm just like, dude, I'm falling apart. I'm like, (laughs) nobody's even at my house when I'm watching it. And I'm like, I don't want to cry too loud. (laughs) Like, it's just, it's so effective and so powerful because it's so simple. What what, what did you find so affecting about it? Yeah, so, like, I think we've all had that experience of correlating a song to an experience. And this particular scene in the movie, I mean, it's exactly that. It is how this song is kind of changed through different times and the baggage that's attached to it and so you kind of are watching the scene where like this song should actually be really beautiful and really wonderful and really powerful but Rini Mara's character is just like unhappy and just just horribly unsatisfied and she wants to really be into the song but she can't and then she sort of just kind of leaves it at that. And you you know that she, her character, I think it's just M is the character's name because um, there's no there's no name stated in the movie. In fact, the IMDb uh, actor listing or, or like credits for it all. It's like Casey Affleck uh, character name is C. Rooney Mara's name is M. <laughs> Uh, there's little boy and doctor <laughs> and man in wheelchair and just stuff like that. So it's right. like that script was probably really fun to write. But, you know, her character is just like wrestling with so much of what's going on and feeling trapped and and unable to get anywhere with it. And I think that's something people have when they listen to music, especially now when you can stream whatever you want and you can pick whatever song perfectly encapsulates your emotion and then you return to it. And it could have been a decade and you're like right back there. I just think it was just masterful. And so, yeah, hit me. Hit me rough, dude. I can't wait to rewatch it again and have those feelings come back. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, for, for the context of the listener, like this is a song that earlier, supposedly Casey Affleck's character had written or composed, or it's a song he knew. Right. And it's one of the things I found most interesting about the movie is the way it portrays the passage of time and the way we experience time. Like you, you're seeing this juxtaposition of she's remembering hearing the song first time as her husband is singing it to her and then you're seeing her listening to it again after he has died which isn't really much of a spoiler because he is the titular ghost that is right, on the poster right. of the movie but like you see that as his character is haunting this space he is he is with her again in the sense that he's there watching her as she's listening to it and she's connecting with him again in the sense that she's listening to this song that he wrote that she remembers listening hearing for the first time and she's in a way reliving this moment but also she's not at all because she's so distant from him even though she's able to in a way reconnect with him again despite the fact he's passed through this thing that he's made and it and it ties into many many of the film's themes 
one of which is this sense of like alienation where she is so alone in this place and he is alone in this place and they're both they're together alone they're they're together alone which is like extreme loneliness i don't know if some people have experienced that where you're in a room full of people but you're totally alone it just amplifies how alone you are and so it's it's very isolating yeah but for casey affleck's character it's so much worse because he's having to, to watch her suffer in a way he he desperately cannot help the person that he loves and cherishes the most and he's in a sad irony trapped in this place that he didn't want to leave which is one of the first things that we sort of established about this film but i mean is it is, is there a particular i mean it's it's difficult to talk about the movie's plot because there really isn't much you know i david lowry stated that he wrote the entire screenplay in one sitting essentially it's 30 pages long and like as far as plot goes it is essentially what i wrote when i said in that imdb post which is a guy dies and he goes back to the spot to try and reconnect but he can't because he's a ghost and so the lion's share of the film is just watching as he goes back to this place and sort of just watches as it evolves and changes over time and one of the things that really struck me as i mentioned is the way it portrays time passing and one of the things that you want to talk about is the how slow this movie is because this movie is very slow and it's very slow in a way that's almost purposefully alienating and challenging to an audience and there's uh one scene in particular that i think encapsulates this more than anything else is it a scene that is four minutes long exactly (laughs) it is the famous (laughs) it is probably more famous than the movie itself is at this point i don't know if people remember as far back as three years ago any anymore for entertainment things unless you need to watch it because it's the third in a series of movies it's six movies long but there's a scene where Rooney Mara eats a pie for four minutes now the context of the scene is her husband has died so I'm just gonna call Casey F like I'm gonna call her Rooney Mara because like you said they don't essentially have names <laughs> they don't have names <laughs> yeah but a friend of hers I think it might be actually might be the the person who's selling the house that she's living in brings a pie like which is a very Texas thing to do this film was shot in Texas and somebody who has relatives who have died in Texas know the way people in Texas comfort you is just give you copious amounts of food. And so she's eating this pie and it's a moment of extreme grief because she is, she's lost most of what she has. Essentially she doesn't seem like a very well person and he said has died. So she's just eating this pie and like grieving. And most movies, they would just show her eating the pie and maybe cut to the empty pie. Maybe they cut to her throwing up because she ate too fast. This movie just, focuses in on this and you're just watching same as Casey Affleck's character is and in that way it puts you in his shoes because he's sitting there watching her eat too and uh Larry has stated that he basically just told her to Rudy just like eat the pie however you want this is your scene I'm just gonna <laughs> the camera doesn't move so he's just like just <laughs> yeah, yeah when you're done we'll cut that's it so she of her own volition ate this pie for four or something minutes and throws up immediately after and I kind of love this scene. I don't know. What, what's your take on the pie scene before we... I think it's great. I think it it is it's it is also something I kind of knew about beforehand. I think it's probably the thing that... Uh, I think it's the thing that gets people to watch the movie. <laughs> like, I think just knowing that it exists is something that draws you in because you're like, well, that sounds interesting. And it's not the interesting demeaning. It's like the interesting, like, I there's something tugging me here. I got to see that. <laughs> it's the void when the void when you stare into the void it stares back at you i i think it's great in fact the first time i watched it this is the scene that really emotionally struck me because you watch it and you're th- you're constant like the whole movie you're constantly thinking about what's actually going on like it, it it's a it's a novel played on screen where if it was a novel you would know everything that's going on in these characters heads but you just don't because that's this medium and this is a scene that really i think puts that to the forefront where if this was a book we would know all of the thoughts about what she's experiencing we would know why she's she's going for another bite of that pie (laughs) Uh, sitting on the floor just keeps keeps digging into it oh i dropped the fork let me use my hands and you would get all that, but you don't. And so now you're sitting there trying to understand. And then you start thinking about things in your own life where you were so miserable and unhappy that you reached in to get another bottle or you reached in to get another cupcake or you reached in to get to just bake so you can have something to eat. And you're just self-medicating, but you keep going and you can't, you're like, you're not getting better. Like you're watching as she's going and she's 
like the the scene is just far enough that you know she's really unhappy you keep hearing her sniffle because the expert uses of, of a boom mic to get just how she's reacting and the, the clacking of the of the fork into the, the pan but then you start to see a glint from her nose and you're like oh my gosh she's weeping like just trying to fight off this this emotional experience and by that point if you have a heart you're weeping <laughs> and you're like oh my please someone just hug her like it's just it's so sad and so yeah i i think it's great I know for my wife, the thing that really got her wasn't the pie, but right afterward, she goes to the bedroom and she falls asleep on his side of the bed. And it's like, it's just like, it, like this movie, it just keeps doing that. It keeps just doing things that are so intimate and personal, but putting them on screen for you to see. And it's like, if the pie doesn't get you, the bed will get you. If the bed doesn't get you, the song will get you. If the song doesn't get you, the and it's just, it's just you're just wearing me down, man. That or you fall, you fell asleep like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> you didn't even see, you didn't even see Casey Affleck sit up in the in the moratorium. So you're you're still back there. <laughs> so exercises and patience. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, like that's. That's how long these moments last in real life. If you're having a moment of weakness or you're trying to like self-medicate through food or you're just unable to like monitor your emotions, you know, if you're having a moment of just like real despair or loss, like most a lot of the movie is just Casey Affleck's character just kind of wandering around. Those moments, they move at this pace. Like they they feel like they last forever. But also like I don't think you get a real natural feel of like the enormity of a moment unless you let it linger isn't that like the great irony because they aren't forever and yet it only ever feels real when we slow things down to kind of take them apart yeah and and like here like this earlier scene where casey and rooney are just like laying in bed next to each other or in each other's arms it feels intimate and real because they just they're not doing anything particularly interesting they're not having a deep conversation particularly like they're just talking and they're just there together and that feels real the relationship feels more real because of it and then Rooney Mara's sense of just doesn't know what to do with herself that feels more real because it's uncomfortable we're sitting there watching this woman cry we're sitting here watching her just like gorge herself in pie like like it feels like a real moment that you're just sort of like observing and well then like I feel like the movie's paced is cooking as time goes on though where like it goes from Casey Affleck is just watching his wife eat pie to, to like suddenly like things are happening and people are moving, people are going around. Then like he's just, he's going forward and time to backward time. Like all these things are happening. And that's kind of how we perceive time where when you're younger, time feels like it lasts forever. Like school, the school day is so long and then summer's here, but then like the school year getting to summer is forever. Then you wait for Christmas to come. And that's just how, cause you're young. That's how time feels. It feels like it lasts forever. And then as you get older, time suddenly starts to lose less and less meaning. And you know, Larry stated that like he feels like this is more his characters losing the restraints of time and all that kind of thing. Where like his character is like he's gone beyond death. Now he's going beyond time as well. But this has a viewing experience that really, for me, to help me like lock into what the movie is trying to say about well, a lot of things, but specifically about like the way time moves it it starts really really slow and gradual and then it slowly starts to like as more things happen and as more experiences come up high so it gets quicker and quicker and then suddenly it's kind of it's just kind of over you know so yeah there was i had a really good phone call with a buddy of mine and uh he had went home to visit his family and he's an older guy and i asked him like have you been home for a while and he's like no not really and so i said like it does it feel like when you go there and you see that things have changed or a building's a different size or has an addition or maybe it's gone, like what does that feel like? And he says, like when I see that a building is gone that I spent time in, it feels like those memories didn't exist or that maybe I, I fabricated them. Like there was, because there's no evidence of it. There was the, I can't look and point and say, that's the tree that I, you know, I fell off and busted my ankle and my friends made fun of me, but then we had a good time getting to the hospital and blah, blah, blah. Because if it's gone, it's like, I mean, I can't point to that and say, yeah, that that's a place that mattered to me. That's a place that defined a period of my life. Once it's gone, it's, it's, yeah, it's so transient. And I think for me, the emphasis and focus of time in the in a ghost story is sort of to 
for for my interpretation of this film because i think this film leaves itself open to a lot of interpretations i think the the running for me like i stepped away with like that death affects everything that death doesn't just like ruin a family or a romance or a relationship but death kind of emphasizes the fact that time runs out and things move on without you we have a scene in the middle that is often the most criticized scene in the film (laughs) where a guy kind of in the midst of a party uses like pseudo philosophy to, and I guess technically you could just say philosophy, but whatever, (laughs) everything surrounding the scene as he's delivering the monologue makes it fit the pseudo philosophy category. But anyways, he's sharing that like, you know, entropy exists. And even if things persevere in your legacy, there's going to be a time when the universe just collapses and it won't matter. Like what, what does it matter? And to me, I sort of stepped away with that, like this b- biblical idea of like drink and be merry for today we die. Like th- there's no purpose in anything because if there's an end to something, then what does it matter if it began? And that's like really sad. In fact, the first time I watched this, I messaged you and I was like, you know, I didn't really I didn't like this movie because of that. And you responded saying, that's interesting. I feel like that the particular line of dialogue is there so that David Lowry can basically disprove it in the second part of the film. And so, yeah, I kind of wanted to, I wanted to bring that up to bring it into here because I really want to hear you kind of extrapolate that because this second time watching, I enjoyed the movie more, but I'm still not sure I agree with that idea that it disproves that philosophical statement so so what do you think about that it's it's funny you bring that up because i I actually don't remember having that conversation um but i well then that just ruins this section i i i mean i remember you saying you don't like that scene in the movie i liked it more this time by the way i do think it it's it's this is one of those movies where like you may not like stuff the first time and then you see it again and you're like Either I can forgive it or, ah, you know, it's not that bad. So I just put that out there. (laughs) Yeah, I I should say, I remember you saying that. I don't remember that I responded that way, which is so funny because for starters, maybe 10 minutes before we started recording, I was finishing up listening to a Q&A that Lowry did. And it was specifically about his own religious beliefs. And he talked about how he was raised raised in Texas. So he was raised very religious, specifically Roman Catholic. And he sort of got into like his own religious views and how the movie reflects that. But he interestingly said that he doesn't agree with a lot of what that character says in the movie. He says, I agree with most of it, I should say. However, he's missing a really big component, which is his thesis does not leave room for hope or wonder in the the world and and as it relates to like existence. And I, he said, I would really, I like to think that the rest of the movie just proves that and it shows that there is room for that. And he talks about the, how the way the movie ends and all the other things that happens in the movie. So I, I actually don't remember that, but I actually remember I was watching. That, I was like, oh, wow, good. Cause that's, <laughs> I remember thinking like, that's kind of how I like to think about it. So I'm glad yeah. uh, David Lowry uh, agrees with me in that regard. But I, yeah, I think that, you know, cause one thing, cause there's a, there's a symbolism of the piano in the house where there's just this piano that was there when they bought the house. And then after uh, Rudy Mara leaves um, the family moves in after them like the kids are playing the piano again um, there's this talk about music and the character writes a song that song is played throughout the film I don't know if you knew this but the guy the composer of the film who composed music for all of David Lowry's films he wrote that song the song that Casey Alpha character sings he wrote that for his band he has that's right and yeah. uh, Lowry was like I love this song and could you base the soundtrack on this so he does he took different pieces from that one song and expanded them into full tracks for the whole soundtrack. So you're essentially oh, hearing cute. pieces of that song, yeah, throughout the movie, which ties into what they're talking about. Like, oh, maybe someday, you know, when aliens come and destroy the earth, they might hear someone might faintly start humming Beethoven's blah blah blah. But what's the point of that in light of all this? And yeah, I think that the film by its end sort of like embraces this idea that like things may they yeah, they fade away, but like that doesn't necessarily move their impact that they have in the people around them because the character at the table has a very humanist idea which is that really we should not think about how our actions affect eternity necessarily but like you know maybe if beethoven and all these other great composers didn't believe in god they'd be writing songs for the people around them and be making music just to better the lives of them and writing for them and 
you know, isn't that kind of what it's all about? And yeah, you know, and I think as a Christian, our response to that is, yeah, whatever. (laughs) Yeah, it's very easy to do that. But I don't think that's what the move he's really about at all, where it's about, I think it's kind of about letting go of this idea that like, unless I do something that's super duper permanent, then what's the point? And part of why I think that is there's this really sad scene where uh, Casey Affleck's ghost is talking to a ghost next door, which interestingly, they initially conceived as a comedic relief moment. But then as they sort of start writing the dialogue for the scene, they're like this is actually really depressing where um, they dubbed the ghost, the grandma ghost, because she wears like a bed sheet that has like all these like floral patterns on it. And they're like, we, they, they kind of in their heads assumed it was a grandmother who had died in the house. And that's the sheet she died in. And so that's the sheet she's wearing. And she's waiting for someone to come back. And she doesn't even remember who, but she's just waiting for them to come back. That's, I mean, that's kind of a basic ghost thing that we think, oh, like spirits are here because they're waiting to like, oh, yada, yada, yada. Early, very early on in the film, we see a scene where Rooney Mara's character is leaving the house. So there's an earlier conversation where Casey Affleck's character and this is a real conversation Lowry had had with his wife because Lowry is a very sentimental person and hates moving. He doesn't like leaving things behind because he's very sentimental about the places that he was at, which very clearly informed his writing of this film. Part of, me, part of his process of picking location was he was picking like houses that looked like the houses he grew up in and things like that. And so, I mean, first off, early in the film, there's Rudy Mars talking about how when she leaves the place, she likes to leave a note. Uh, just things she wants to remember, poems, song lyrics, that kind of thing. So she leaves a note and then she leaves. She's in the car and she's driving away. And as the camera sort of lingers on her face, you see that she has kind of like this sense of like, okay, like, all right, shaking off the dust, you know, things have been tough. And you get a sense that she's, she has leaving, she is leaving. And for them, she more or less kind of exits the film a lot of ways from that point on as we sort of shift focus to Casey Affleck's journey as a ghost. But then, like, it's cutting back to Casey Affleck's character, who's still in this house, and he's just sort of there, and he's just trapped. And, I mean, one, one other thing that people talk about this film is the way it's shot, where it's in this very specific as- aspect ratio. It's, like, 3, 3, 1, something like that. Yeah, it's really tight. But the whole movie feels like you're, you're looking at a box, and that was intentional, as he felt like, you know, essentially, <laughs> Casey Affleck's character is trapped in a box. He's trapped in this one location. He's trapped in this house. And so there's a clear difference between somebody who's sort of like go is able to move on versus somebody like Casey Affleck's character who's just sort of lingering he's stuck and you know I like to think part of it is this idea of all these places that we live all these places that we are there are you know ghosts to haunt those places there are memories there's lives that have been there there's people have lived there and you know those things are still there they're in the makeup they're in the design of the places that we live and they're before we live there, there are people that have the house I'm in now. Someone lived here before I lived here. And this might be a theme that hits harder with people who either A, have lived in older houses like I have, or even some people who are fortunate enough to live in the house that their their grandfather's grandfather's grandfather built the house's bare hands and they passed it down from generation right. to generation. And that theme right. might hit harder with them. But like just because like you can't make something that's 110% permanent, like that doesn't mean that you haven't added something of value to the world and to the place. And I think being able to like accept that is kind of part of what I think Lowry's trying to say, but more to what he's talking about with the idea of like there's hope and magic. I mean, the, the very premise of the film, the idea that even though we Rooney Mara can't see Casey Affleck anymore, he's still there and he's still there to tangibly affect her life. I mean, it externalizes itself in sometimes he does like typical ghost things. Like he can knock something off a shelf. That's fine. Like, that's just that's just what ghosts do, I suppose, which I thought was a fun idea where like it is like if you imagine a movie like Poltergeist, but then imagine those ghosts in the movie Poltergeist aren't actually vengeful spirits are just sad because they miss their <laughs> families and that's why they're doing ghost things. But yeah, he's still there and he can affect it. And even then, the song that he wrote for Rudy Barra's character, she still finds value in it. She still can listen to it. And I don't know. I think that's enough. I don't think Casey Affleck needs to make songs that hundreds and thousands of years from now you could still listen to, but I feel like, yeah, I feel like a Christian reading, like a lazy Christian reading would be like, well, this movie's dope because we know ghosts aren't real. We know that we go (laughs) to heaven. We know that that pseudo philosophy at drunken parties doesn't (laughs) matter. Uh, It's, it's the first, the first set of um, film criticism is realizing that uh, 
everything that's on screen doesn't necessarily mean the director agrees with it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, in his yeah. own words, he's like, I'm not being prescriptive. I'm like necessarily, he's just putting a guy there to, to say right. some things he might kind of think that guy who's the 30 year old guy who goes to high school parties and vapes still <laughs> like whoever that guy is. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like I, but I do think a Christian reading quote unquote, which I guess is what we're here to do is like, we know that like our actions do have weight, but the weight we, the weight that we place in them isn't like a human measurement of value where like you're only worth something. If you made a song that people are still singing hundreds of years from now, like your value is what you add to, I mean, the kingdom of God, but like, we know that all of our actions have weight in a like eternal sense, like the way we treat people here and now right. affects like our witness for Christ, that whether or not we spend our time building the kingdom of God and sharing the gospel that has weight. And you know, I like to think that if we do the things prescribed in the Bible, like, okay, care for widows and orphans, like take people in off the street, feed the hungry, like, you know, visit people in prison and clothe the colds and the sick. Like those are things that have an eternal value, even if nobody's talking about them yeah. <laughs> hundreds of years from now. Yeah. Like I, I like to think that the movie does a good job of like pointing out how kind of vain this, this idea is like, only if people remember me and think I did awesome things, <laughs> does my life have weight and value? Like, no, like that's not it at all. Like, and I don't think like Casey Affleck's jury in this film doesn't have weight just because like there aren't people around to witness him be a ghost or whatever. Like, you know. Yeah, a lot of what you're sharing made me think of uh, Colossians 4, 5 through 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. There, There's two things I kind of get from that passage. It's It kind of emphasizes how important time is spent with people, but it also emphasizes the comfort in knowing that through wisdom, you can recognize how best to use that time. I feel like some people worry like that charge is more more hard than it sounds because of like wisdom being a keyword there. But I just think that's a cushion because uh, something I was thinking about is like when I, so this weekend, Catherine and I went to my parents' house and it doesn't matter what age you are, but when your parents say, you want to go get ice cream, you say you, you say yes, you always say yes, because ice cream's awesome. So we went out and got ice cream. And while we're there, this dude starts talking to us, which is cool. And I, I have no problem talking to strangers. I love it. Um, but we step outside to eat because we don't want to be inside because you have to take your mask off inside. And that seems to be the the glory of COVID. We could not go the whole episode without it mentioning that. Um, oops. And uh, we're outside and the guy comes out and he starts talking to us. And we had a really great conversation. I asked him like questions about how he was doing. He was sharing about you know, how... COVID's affected him. I asked him, like, how, how's your support system? Were you able to land well? Because he's not working. And he says, like, yeah, I'm really glad that my brother has a job that I was able to help him with, but it's really tough. And he started getting into political stuff, which never bothers me. I know other people don't know how to listen to people. And so they think when someone starts getting political, all they want to do is fight back. I'm not going to obviously share his name and none of you people listening know who he is, but he starts sharing things like, you know, he doesn't trust Trump and he doesn't trust uh, the Democrats either. He doesn't trust anybody to take care of him. He has no faith in the political system to take care of him. And why am I bringing that up? Well, I'm bringing it up because all of that's so important. Like me being able to just be a random stranger, listening to him patiently, ask him questions. Like I asked him like, how's your support system and how are you doing and how's your wife and stuff like that. I just met this guy <laughs> and at this point we're practically best friends. Um, he tells us he's there at that, at that uh, Dairy Queen because there was like a car show going on and he likes to re refit cars. And so he brought his car over and he actually thought we were part of that. And so he was learning about it. So now I'm learning more and more about him. And something I like to do when I meet strangers is kind of leave things like, obviously we talk political stuff. And so it was like kind of dour, and I wanted to make sure like when we leave, like he's able to feel like better about it. So I asked, like, do you mind revving your car for us? Because he said it was really loud. And it was I, it was fantastic. This car was so loud. <laughs> um, but I knew that really brought him a lot of joy. And all of that was like really important, at the very least to me. <laughs> it was really important to me because I love hearing how people are doing, whether they're complete strangers or they're best friends. 
And I know that like, even for my parents, it was something they were proud of. Like when we got in the car after my parents were like, we're really, you know, we're proud of you and your comfortability to talk to people. And what is it? There's a proverb that's like the children are the, are the pride of their, <laughs> of the parents. Um, so that made me feel a little better, but, um, all of that to say is like, that's such an innocuous and random moment. I don't know. It, it feels so powerful to me to be a part of it. And I actually praise the Lord for in, inviting me to have a conversation with him in that way. Um, I was praying that like, now that I know his name, I can pray for him directly and praying that he, um, the Lord's able to provide a support system for him, ultimately invite him into the kingdom, of course. Yeah. So it's just, it's little moments like that that seem like they don't matter that I think this movie is emphasizing throughout by saying how much they do. There's that scene in the beginning of the movie where they're like talking about wanting to stay home or not in this house or not, or move out or not. And like Casey's character is like, he wants to stay because of the history. And like, you kind of get these glimpses of the history and not all of it's like good. (laughs) Obviously he died right out front of the house. (laughs) And so like, there, it's but it but it doesn't mean it's it doesn't matter so i don't know i think like personal testimony i think this film does a good job of emphasizing that little moments are actually really really big in the grand scheme of thing but also you don't need to say in the grand scheme of things because they're just big and that's it so it was um it was interesting to hear when lowry was reflecting on his own religious upbringing which is a very strict roman catholic from what the sounds of it talks about how he specifically designed the movie and he admitted that undoubtedly because it's just part of like his upbringing his dna at this point he's sure that like the catholic theology of um, purgatory had probably had some sort of effect on the movie as he's like i would understand why some people would look at this as almost a reflection of the very idea of purgatory but he talks about how he specifically left the movie kind of he's in his own words he said he left the door open to sort of any sort of religious interpretations of the film because he a wanted it to be a movie that his parents could go see and enjoy. But also he's like, I have tons of friends who have all or of all kinds of faith. And so he didn't really want the movie to like go into any sort of specific religious kind of um, territory necessarily, which I think is part of what makes talking to the movie so interesting as he's, he's, he's using like a very common Americana trope, which actually, I don't know if we talked about like why he even picked a, <laughs> why this ghost? I'm sure some people are wondering. Did you wonder that, Melvin? Why this ghost? Why this ghost in particular, as opposed to a different ghost? Or why the sheet as opposed why to- Why the sheet? Why the sheet? Yeah, why the sheet? So first off, it's actually not a sheet. Um, If you put a bed sheet on, he's like, first off, he said that there's no bed sheet big enough to cover like a grown man like Casey Affleck. Oh, yeah, it's just a giant piece of cloth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they had, it's actually a full costume. So he's like, it's like putting on several different sweaters and just a helmet you have to put on to make it look like that. And wearing that 110 degree Texas weather was apparently horrible. But in his own description, he said, he's like, I always found that first off, he said, I think it is kind of funny. Like, he's like, I don't mind if people say they saw the moving parts that made them laugh because it's an, he's like, it's inherently funny visual to see like that ghost standing, just like standing like expressionless next to some of the things in the movie that happened. He's like, that's an inherently funny thing. That's fine. But he's like, there's something very sad and lonely about the figure. It's just, it's just like the idea of that classic ghost is standing in these situations and being kind of alone sort of intrigued him. Formless. There's nothing to define the, the individual. It could just be anybody else. Yeah, it might not actually be Casey Affleck under there. It might. It actually <laughs> is, believe it or not. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> except for the scenes where Casey Affleck has to also like be in the scene in some way. Yeah, apparently, yeah. Well, that would be kind of amazing. Also, apparently, he had actual like street like magicians, like professional magicians on set, like like to help do some of the practical effects in the movie. That's great because they wanted to look normal, which is cool. But he's like, when you look at that, you think that's a ghost. We also don't think that's a ghost. Like you understand that's supposed to be a ghost, but you don't react to it like you'd react to a ghost. So he's saying getting to write a ghost story with his character is very intriguing to him, but he loved the sense of nostalgia it brings where that's a classic looking ghost. And that's part of why he shot the film and the aspect ratio it did. Like that's how older movies were shot. And so the sense of nostalgia kind of permeates the entire film. And that ties into the idea of like this, this film is like this look at our past in so many ways where you have, you're looking at a house and the people that used to live there. You're looking at this old form of storytelling, this like classic filmmaking, this older ghost that could be 
it's we know who it is in the context of film but there certainly are ghosts like this everywhere and it, and it evokes this like feeling of your childhood and the film is in a lot of ways kind of almost like a journey to sort of watch that thing you know i mean in this one literally die <laughs> but also like yeah to let those things kind of like fade away i think is such a i don't know it's a really good example of using the medium to tell a very unique story unto itself like i don't think this would work as a video game or an <laughs> arg or, or something like this is a very visual experience and it's part of why i so hardly endorse it can we get into interpretation yeah absolutely what is your interpretation daniel <laughs> oh Ooh. well before i get into that i want to the last time i shared my interpretation of this film with somebody was in a facebook group i'm actually not sure which one it is it might have been it was in some movie group. I can't remember what it is, but I was talking to somebody. They are a Christian and I don't know if I don't want to paint with two broad strokes here, but I do think sometimes Christians and religious people in general, people who have a set philosophy that they see the world in and a set belief system that they very firmly hold on to like to try and get very exact interpretations about things and like to, because they see a world in a very specific way. Like, you know, God created the world. This is the Bible is the inspired word of God. Like all that stuff is set in place. Like they're, you know, dogmas essentially. And that's not bad. Like I am a very religious person. I'm, I specifically am a you know reformed Christian. I have very specific beliefs on things. I'm totally fine with that. But like they, that, that way of looking at things tends to permeate everything. And sometimes I've noticed, I'm just saying it's something that's happening all the time. And so I was talking to this person about the movie and we were talking about it. And I, just like giving my thoughts in the film and i was like you know it really feels like this like meditation on time and just sort of you're watching as time passes and you're looking at the things that we leave behind and the value of the things we leave behind but also like you know letting go and moving on and like sort of asking the question of what value is life if you know things fade away and and the person was very adamantly against that they were just like you can't prove that (laughs) <laughs> it's like, what what okay. do you mean i can't prove it it's like well show me that show me where it says that in the film i was like well first off there is this like 10 minute monologue in the middle of the movie where a guy talks about almost these things specific, <laughs> specifically <laughs> but also like it's okay if you don't think that like this movie is open to interpretation like you can watch the movie and take a lot of things away from it and he was like yeah but you can't there's prove so that much. like yeah there's, there's so, so much and it's purposefully open-ended in so many ways and i think the more i think about it, the more i've watched the and upon repeat viewings of the film like it feels like almost it is less about coming to almost a set understanding of something and more about getting you to feel certain emotions and and sort of explore these areas of your own feelings on these things yeah about death about time about life about relationships and alienation and loneliness but i was talking to this person and they really they were like no you cannot prove without a shadow of a doubt that this is the theme of the movie that this is what the movie is about and i kept literally just being like i mean i'm sorry but that's fine but i just really i feel this way because of these reasons but it's okay if you don't agree with me and it was just such a bizarre like this movie needs to say what it means and it needs to exactly mean these things and i want it to show me I don't want to prove to me that the movie means these things that you're saying it says. This was an often Facebook conversation I had th- around three years ago now. And I think about it almost every day to some extent. <laughs> Whenever I see anyone talking about movies, I just imagine this guy just jumping in and be like, yeah, but can you prove that? Like just grabbing them by the shoulders and shaking them. Like this color is blue, but how <laughs> <laughs> can yeah. you prove it? <laughs> and, uh, but it's good to see that Ben Shapiro has since gone on to have a very successful career. And I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just joshing you. Um, why, why are you calling him out? <laughs> Don't you know that a ghost story is specifically about time? Yeah. yeah. Or what, how would he say it though? He'd be. I don't know. <laughs> David Lowry. I, um, he, you know, he wrote this movie and he did it in 30 days. I don't <laughs> hate. Like, I have no opinions on Ben. I feel like the only person in the world who has no opinions on Ben Shapiro. I feel like people I, either I hate mean, him or love him. I just, just, I just know him from the memes at this point. I don't. I don't think I've ever listened to anything he's ever said. So. From the memes and Cardi B at this, like to this week, I guess. So. <laughs> But anywho, uh, <laughs> who would have thought know. Cardi B would make it into this episode? Yeah, no, but yeah, like 
in the, the the one way I will almost definitively say it, uh, disagree with Ben Shapiro, I suppose, which is a sentence to, to end all sense this episode is just this rigidness of like, this movie needs to work on a very specific, like it needs to hit, adhere to these very specific requirements and, may, and work on this very specific logic for me to accept it. And I think this is a movie that you just really need to sit back and just uh, let it go. You need to like, like, like open your heart to it and just be like, okay, like this is what the ghosts look like. There's not going to be a lot of dialogue. This is it. And you just have to accept that. And you have to be there for the ride they're putting on. But, and so in terms of like, how do I interpret the film? Like, you know, like well, I said, how did he, how did he interpret the film? He didn't like it. <laughs> he oh, just, so he, thought he didn't have any, like, he didn't have like, I didn't like just, it because it was about something else. He, he, he just, just thought said, it was a bunch of like mumbo it. jumbo. Yeah. He was just like, this movie doesn't make any sense. Like I didn't get it. Like blah, blah. blah. And, well, prove that it doesn't bad. make any sense. Well, yeah. <laughs> prove that you don't like, like it. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what I was getting. It was just like, okay, it's fine. But like, just because you had this subjective experience watching the film doesn't mean that it doesn't mean something else to somebody else. And so, I mean, like, I'm sure that like, now that I'm sitting here being like, hey, man, the movie's whatever you want it to be, blah, blah. That if I ever at any point make another point about movie not making any sense. Someone's like, whoa, you said in this one review, but like different movies are working in different logic. Like if a movie is presenting itself to have a very straightforward story and it's making a very specific point, I think a movie can fail to make those points. I think it failed to convey what it's trying to convey. The difference here is this is a movie that is purposefully like trying not to get too specific about certain things. It's trying not to like make any strong statements one way or the other about certain things. It's like, the whole part of the purpose of the pie eating scene from what I gathered from the various interviews of Lowry that I've seen is he's, he wants to make you uncomfortable. And he said, and like the joke has kind of been, it's almost like this like test they have to pass to watch the rest of the movie. Or if you're just not in it for that, then it's not for you, you know, and that's okay. And so the movie is not trying to make a specific singular statement about life and death about whatever. And that's okay for this. It's a different thing. If like, I don't know if like the Shawshank Redemption, like halfway through, just had a big musical number and suddenly they went to space. And then they, then they're like, didn't we say some neat stuff? You know, like that would be actually never, that movie sounds awesome. But like, it I'm sure it's awesome. better. Uh, it'd be weird. Like if the Passion of the Christ, if Jesus is talking about aliens at the end, and they're like, didn't we do a great job of respecting the, the biblical story right. of Jesus? Like you can fail at a particular mission. And then that's where I start docking your points. You know, we docked or a movie supposed to be an action movie. And it's boring. You know, there's a, every movie has different metrics that which you judge it by. And so yeah, like when it comes it, to- we docked points, I personally docked points on like something like think if you can think all the way back to February, 2020, <laughs> when we had birds of prey, uh, guest appearance on the podcast and by guest i mean we just talked about it i didn't like it because it was rated r i was like i think it should have been pg-13 i don't think it succeeded in being a fun rated r film i think it was too shocking and then you're over here like i thought it was great (laughs) and it's like that's fine i i'm not gonna prove have you prove to me why you liked something like how can i prove to somebody the about the food i like when i put it in my mouth it it endorphins trigger in my brain <laughs> that's about as specific as i could get i can't really like get into it like i think it makes me think a lot about like uh just film reviews in general when it comes to like print reviews because they get so flowery and they get so specific in fact i i roll my eyes the most when reading like uh music reviews because that's when i think they try the hardest to make sure that they're sounding as poetic as the thing that they're listening to um, when at the end of the day, like it really is just like, yeah, I, I like it. <laughs> I, I don't like that. <laughs> well, why? And that's when you can start to get into specifics. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think I think you're right, though. I think this movie, apart from what David Lowry already says, that he wants to leave it for interpretation. I think he succeeds in making it an interpretive experience because I can't I can't imagine it being open ended and having more lines. In fact, most movies fall into the trap of wanting to be open ended, but then have just some of the most blatant dialogue in the world. (laughs) And you're you're listening to a director be like, yeah, I really wanted to get the the uh, individual thinking about specific things and really meditate on this. And I wanted them to like, you know not take everything at face value. Meanwhile, they'll have like a character that just says like something so black and white. It's like, um, uh, (laughs) in, in, uh, revenge of the Sith, 
with um obi-wan and anakin and uh what is it um you were supposed to jo- join a no, what is it? Uh, from my perspective, bring balance, brown, balance of the force, not destroy it. Right. Well, there's that, but then also, um, he has the line that's, um, uh, from my perspective, the Jedi are, are evil, and it's yeah. just like you didn't, you didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> like, I knew that that's what you felt. <laughs> yeah. George, George Lucas is a lot of things, but subtle is not one of them. No, no. So yeah, I think I think that's spot on. Well, I mean, I think just to kind of wrap it up, it, it my but my thing I always resort back to is I don't care what your opinion is. I just really want to see how you get there. And I think for a movie like this, it's inviting you to think about it. And it's inviting you. The word that's used in every review and every interview I've read is meditate. They want the movie wants you to to meditate. And I think that can be a little like kind of preachy, kind of flowery. Like, yeah, like I don't you don't. That's just another way way of saying the movie wants you to sit there and think about the movie while you're watching it. But yeah, I think that there are certain movies that are asking you to experience them a certain way. I don't think it's bad. And I think when people say like, oh, you just didn't get the movie, I think a less elitist way of saying it would be like, you know, the, there is a certain way that the movie is inviting you to experience it. And I think that in a way you kind of like, if you're going to sit there and watch a movie, the least you could do is sit there and just be like, okay, like this is the movie's asking me to, you know, do this it's asking me to like go with his pace and think about the slowness of what it's doing or the movie's asking me to confront some difficult questions or issues or the movie's asking me just to sit back and not think too hard and have a good time and none of those are bad or better than the other that's just the different types of film and that's a different art asks you to interpret it different ways you know like the way i would stare at like a Norman Rockwell, like 50s Americana painting, and the way to enjoy that painting is the same way I look at like cubism or something, you know? Right. And so I just think that's just part of the package of interpretation. And so, like, I think sometimes people get upset at critics or even people like us when we sit there and, like, their initial reaction is ghost stories boring. And then when we sit there and go, oh, it's saying all these nice, deep things, I'm not calling you stupid. And I don't think most critics are calling you stupid. I just think that for some people, they just didn't do that they just were you know the, i read an amazing article after this movie came out or a couple went to see see a ghost story and they loved it the um the wife cried at the end of the film but everyone in the audience was laughing and mocking the film they were just like jeering it and like the guy was talking about this horrible experience he had seeing the movie and just and it's part of why i've always wanted to talk about this movie a little bit is it's so interesting to me that i can sit there and have this wonderful experience watching the movie you can sit there and you can get like brought to tears alone in your home watching this. And there's other people that were (laughs) mocking it and laughing at it and like could not believe that people were watching it. And it's just, sometimes you just have to get on that wavelength and the divide between the people who enjoy something and people who don't isn't a intelligence divide necessarily. I'm not saying it doesn't happen here and there, but (laughs) like, it's just, I'm I'm sure, I'm sure it does, but like there, yeah, of course. Yeah. It's just, I just think people need to be more willing to sit there and be like, okay, like what type of movie is this? Like, like how should how should i engage with this and how should i experience it and it's it it can be a little difficult and for some people they will never make that jump because for them movies are some for some people movies are just just entertainment that's all they want from it or movies are distraction and they don't want something to think too hard about or they like a particular type of movie and that's fine i'm sure everyone here has been going through netflix or hulu and the minute they see someone in historical garb they're like nope not for me or the minute they see like based on a true story they see it's a romance film they're like that's not for me and that's okay because you don't want to engage with those movies the, the way they're asking you to, you know, that's okay. So which A24 film had worse marketing or less successful marketing, a ghost story or it comes at night? Oh, it comes in night hands. Down. <laughs> <laughs> a ghost story was at least promising a type of experience that the movie provided. It comes at night was basically a different film. A completely different movie. Uh, we'll, we'll cover that movie someday. Cause I, I think I'm turning into a Trey Edward, a Trey Edward Schultz Stan. I like, I like that movie not to spoil it, but I really like that movie. I just think it was murdered by marketing. Well, when, when my friend and I went to go see it, we caught it and we left and he's like, he go, he looks at me and he goes, I mean, I mean, I didn't, I didn't need a monster, but like, I think I wanted one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the problem with that one's marketing. We'll cover it someday because yeah. everyone's heard, everyone and their mother knows that I really like waves. So we're going to have to do, do Trey Edward Schultz movies sometime, but it's. Do you, do you remember the trailers for Bridge to Terabithia? 
Oh, and that that got me. And I was yeah. only like twelve or fourteen. Well, I don't know. Where it's promising like a Lord of the Rings Chronicles of Narnia type adventure with monsters, and then it's not that at all. It's not so. that at all. And then it's only like the last literal last minute that shows the trailer. <laughs> oh man. We'll get to that one too. I think Castle will probably <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a, that. <laughs> we're gonna cover that hot film everyone's talking about, the Bridge of Terabithia movie from like two thousand. That's got a it's got a cult following. I think at last I heard people really like the adaption of that. They said it's a good adaption. I don't know though. So Melvin, what did you think of a ghost story? Yeah, I love it. I think everyone should check it out. It's ninety minutes. It's very yeah. easy to watch. It's not even ninety minutes. It's like it's nine ninety two credits. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. The credits are pretty long and slow, and they overlay with kids playing and wind blowing, so it really hits you. Or make you laugh because you're like frat boys going out on a Friday night. I don't know. Yeah, I, I highly recommend this movie. I think it's great. I think it's really interesting and uh, contemplative in a way that's, as the director intended, very inclusive. And I think I think Christian viewers, I think it's a good thinker. I think it'll really. I think part of the value of seeing any movie that presents a philosophy that may not necessarily align with yours is it makes you think more deeply about the one that you do hold to. I think for Christians, it can be a very valuable experience to, you know, think about, I mean, death, obviously, and why we um, don't fear death necessarily, but also just think about your legacy, what you leave behind and the things that maybe you need to let go of and just about the enormity of time itself. And if that doesn't make you a little bit more in awe of the God we serve, then I don't know, man. But it's just my feeling. Then I, I guess you're just not <laughs> a Christian. End, yeah, I'm going to end with <laughs> waving my finger at the audience. <laughs> Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you've seen a ghost story, what did you think of it? Were you deeply moved by this film, or is the whole sheet ghost thing a bit too absurd for you? If you're listening on Cinematic Doctrine's website, let us know in the comments below, or shoot us an email to cinematicdoctrine at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review for the podcast in your respective podcast app at the end of this episode. Unlike YouTube or Reddit, there isn't really a way to let us know how we're doing with a thumbs up or a thumbs down, so the best way to leave your thoughts on the podcast is to write a review on iTunes, Podchaser, or wherever you listen. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. You also gain access to the pre-show, a Patreon-exclusive podcast series where my co-host Daniel and I casually talk movies, Christianity, and life itself. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, and Melanie. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. All this will be available in the show notes. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.